David Linden. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mr Walker, and as ever, what a pleasure it is to serve under your chairmanship, and I look forward to doing so again on Wednesday uh, of next week. Um, I want to commend the Honourable Gentleman the Member for Sutton and Cheam on opening the debate, and also to thank the 116 constituents of the Centre of the University of Glasgow East um, for signing this petition. Um, I mean, I left huge amounts of space uh, in, in my notes for, for summing up contributions, and I've got to say, I mean, I normally come along to petitions, debates, and this place is normally stuffed. Sometimes you can't get a seat in here. Um, and I, I must say I'm quite struck by how empty Westminster Hall is this afternoon. I'm sure it's nothing to do with the fact that quite a lot of MPs are very conscious of the fact when they leave this place, they can go and park their backsides on the red leather. Um, so perhaps it's an issue of self-interest. I don't know. I'm only speculating, uh, Mr Walker. But I did think it was rather ironic that uh, I was saying to the staff in my constituency office that on Friday um, this week my, my week will be concluded uh, my, my week will be concluded um, by visiting a care home in my constituency and I thought it was rather remarkable that I could stand up and talk about another care home this afternoon, that is the House of Lords. Um, anybody who watched the programme The Lords will hear uh, people talk about it's the most exclusive uh, daycare uh, unit in central London. <laughs> Um, and I'm reminded about uh, Lord Palmer, who took part in that documentary, the, the noble Lord Palmer, um, who, to say, is a bit of a character, would be, would be putting it mildly. Um, this is a gentleman who has a 110-room mansion and was complaining about the, the little uh, pay that he gets at just £300, uh, 300 pounds a day, of course, tax-free. Um, and I've got to say, uh, Mr Walker, I, I didn't know anything of this Lord Palmer chap, um, so I thought, well, I, I, shall go and, I shall go and look him up. So I, th I thought it would be helpful for the House, because... We don't get the opportunity to talk about these folk very often. Um, so, Adrian Palmer is the fourth Baron Palmer. Adrian Bailey, Nottage Palmer, fourth Baron Palmer, an aristocrat and landowner in Scotland. Lord Balmer succeeded his uncle in the peerage in 1990 and is now one of 90 hereditary peers elected to remain in the House of Lords after the passing of the House of Lords Act 1999. He sits as a cross -bench. I'm sure he's a perfectly affable chap and certainly seems like quite an eclectic or eccentric individual when you watch the, the programme eh, Meet the Lords. Um, but it does come to this point where this is someone who has never been subjected to election before, um, but sits in that place as a, a member of the eh, as a hereditary peer. Um, it will come as no surprise that me speaking as a nationalist politician, I'm quite happy to outline our position in the House of Lords. We think it should be abolished. We have nothing to do with it. Uh, I can say that on this, we are whiter than white. In our 50 years of continued parliamentary representation in this place, we have never taken up a peerage despite being offered them. We've never done it. We're not here to play the Westminster game, and I'm very glad to say that that is the case. I'm disappointed that other parties do take part in it, but what an absolute shambles, Mr Walker. You know, it's the, the only larger legislature in the whole of the world is the Chinese National People's Congress. Um, with a total number of 2,987 seats. Of course, the, the other place, uh, our comrades in Ermin uh, along the corridor, they've, they've got 800. Um, and when you consider and you compare those numbers, you know, in China, uh, a population of 1.4 billion, and they have 2,987 members of the National Congress. And we, a country of just 66 million, have 800 of them stuffed into that absolute circus along there. It really does make an absolute mockery of the whole system. Um, I've uh, spoken before, not least in, in committee as well, where uh, the Honourable Lady from, from Norwich, who, who serves as the Minister, I've spoken about my time uh, doing work with the Westminster Foundation for Democracy. I've got to say, Mr Walker, I, I do find it somewhat embarrassing when I go and do work with Westminster Foundation for Democracy because to appear on behalf of an organisation called the Westminster Foundation for Democracy implies that this is a place of democracy, when in fact the Westminster Parliament, the Palace of Westminster, is a place of limited democracy. We see, not, not long, I think only a couple of weeks ago, um, chief whips on both the Labour side and the government side were having to issue notices to members of the other place, urging them not to fall asleep. Now, I don't see what kind of message that sends out. When I go to Tunisia or to Uganda to talk about the merits of democracy from Westminster, what an absolute embarrassment that this is the kind of thing that happens here. And I was reminded um, by the, the wonderful book from the late Robin Cook, uh, and I very much recommend it to the House, uh, the, the Point of Departure, but it was a fantastic quote I read a number of years ago. And Robin Cook, of course, wrestled with House of Lords reform, um, but he said in his book, at least we are all agreed that the present half-reformed state of the Lords was unsupportable. Britain now shares with the Sutu the unenviable distinction of being the only two countries in which hereditary chieftains still retain the right to pass laws for the rest of the nation. As Foreign Secretary, I had spoken in support of open government at a Europe-Africa summit. I was rebuked by the President of an African country which might generously be described 
as he guided the democracy, who objected that he could not be blamed for failing to introduce full democracy after only 50 years of independence, when Britain had failed to get rid of the hereditary principle after 500 years of parliament. And it was remarkable, this, this guy's now dead, and we still have these hereditary peers sitting over in the, the House of Lords. It makes an absolute mockery of it. And the, further, the thing that makes a further mockery of it is the fact that we have le clerics still legislating the 26 bishop temporal and spiritual. There, are, there is only one other country in the world that has clerics that legislate, and that is Iran. Just think about it. Just let that sink in. The only other legislature in the world that allows clerics to legislate is Iran, and we're part of that as well. It really does make an absolute mockery. And of course, myself, uh, my honourable friend from the city of Chester and indeed the minister, have a long-standing engagement on a Wednesday morning to consider, a, well, we don't really consider, we consider a, a motion to adjourn for, in respect of the Parliamentary Constituencies Amendment Bill. And that bill, uh, from my honourable friend, the member from Manchester Central, seeks to protect this House from the government's plans to cut the number of MPs from 650 down to 600. So the government talks a good game about cutting the cost of politics, yet they continue to stuff people into the House of Lords. We have lords like, I hesitate to use the word noble, Lord Hanningfield, who was caught this routine of clocking in and clocking out, wandering into the Palace of Westminster for a couple of minutes, signing on, then getting this £300 a day tax free. And I would very much commend my honourable gentleman, my friend, the member for Edinburgh Eastern, who's come up with an excellent idea, I think, of somehow changing the rules in here that would be able to track how long members of the House of Peers are actually in the building, because it certainly seems that some of them walk in and walk back out only a couple of minutes later, and at the moment we've got no way of tracking that, and I think that makes a real mockery of the current system. But um, I, I've got to say, I, I pride myself in the fact that I start every parliamentary week by going out in my constituency and door knocking, and I did the exact same before I caught that half twelve flight to London this afternoon, and I was out in the Calvi area of my constituency, which is an area where there is certain amounts of deprivation. And I've got to say, my constituents in Calvi look at that place, the House of Lords, and wonder, how do these folk represent them? And I've got to say, you look at the, 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 the information that's been brought forward by the Electoral Reform Society that shows that something like 85% of peers are all kind of coalesce around this little southeastern part of England. So we don't have members of the House of Lords that represent all parts of the United Kingdom and can bring their expertise. It really does seem to be the case that it is people from this small corner. And I've got to say, where are the Lords who are our tenement Lords? Where are the apprentice Lords? Where are the, the Lords who are from a manual labour background? Because it seems to me, and I say this with respect to the Honourable Gentleman from Henley, it seems to me that it's all people who are from the professions um, of, of lawyers or accountants. And then we come to the issue of corruption, um, the, the, the donors, the cash for votes, whether it's the, the DUP in the House of Commons being bought off with a billion pounds to go and vote with the government, or in the fact that in the past we've seen people who've been offered peerages for donations to political parties. Um, I think that really does bring the place into disrepute as well. And then we come to the issue of rewards for failure. And I think of the case of the constituency of Perth and North Perthshire. An honourable friend, the member for Perth and North Perthshire, won his seat by, I think, 26 votes, defeating... Uh, the, the Conservative candidate at the time, a gentleman called Ian Duncan, who was a member of the European Parliament. And so, quite rightly, my honourable friend from Perth and North Perthshire took up his seat in the House of Commons and does a very diligent job as chair of the Scottish Affairs Select Committee and indeed our shadow leader of the House of Commons. But his opponent, now Lord Duncan of Springbank, sits in the other place, having received no votes, indeed rejected at the ballot box just over a year ago, but was stuffed into the House of Lords he wasn't just stuffed in there as someone to scrutinise legislation, but he was stuffed in there as somebody who is now a government minister. And we have the absolutely bizarre spectacle, Mr Walker. We have all these fine new Scottish Tory MPs who come here, and none of them were considered worthy enough to become the junior Scotland office minister. Instead, it was left to Lord Duncan of Springbank, unelected, uh, to, to, to fly the flag for the Scotland office as a junior minister. But I want to talk about one thing in particular, and it's about the duty of care that we owe to some of our colleagues in the House of Lords. Um, I know that it's not the convention in this House to talk out of school, and that it's a bit of an old boys' club, but I make no apology for saying that on Tuesday the 27th of March, myself and a number of my honourable friends were going out for a run after parliamentary business had concluded, and the Lords were sitting late that night because they were considering the Nuclear Safeguards Bill. And so as myself and two or three of my honourable friends were getting our running gear on, 
We found an elderly gentleman lost in the members' lobby in the House of Commons, where our cloakroom clock room is. Absolutely confused as to where he was. Didn't know what day of the week it was. And one thing that we noticed was the little red and white pass. And he didn't realise that he was on the completely wrong side of the building. Didn't know what day of the week it was, let alone, let alone what clause or schedule of the Nuclear Safeguards Bill was being considered. And I understand that governments of various colours, on a day when it's a tight vote, will try and get their people in here. But there is something incredibly serious about bringing somebody in here who has not the, the mental faculties that they require, not only to know what day of the week it is, but indeed what kind of legislation it is a scrutiny. And that is the kind of thing that does happen in here. And I know it's uncomfortable for everybody in here to talk about it because we all know that it happens. People being wheeled in here who don't know what day of the week it is, but are somehow scrutinising legislation. And the final thing that I would say, and it's, it's with a degree of regret, because uh, I do hold a uh, honourable friend from the member of the City of Chester, and indeed Labour colleagues in high esteem, um, but I think there's a challenge to the Labour Party for this as well. The Labour Party in the past have talked uh, under the, the regime of the Right Honourable Gentleman from Islington North that they would take a principled approach to the House of Lords. Um, but we now have these ermine comrades, the, the Lord Momentums, um, only recently in the, the last rounds of... Uh, appointments to the House of Lords. We have the former General Secretary of the British Labour Party who is now being appointed to the House of Lords, Martha Ossimore um, and uh, another, uh, I think Pauline uh, Coleman I think was the name. Um, so there is a challenge here that if we are all serious about halting the absolute shambles that is the House of Lords then we've all got to be signed up to that. Uh, very happy to give away to the Honourable Gentleman. Thank uh, you. I remember for giving way. Is he aware that uh, one of the conditions of uh, those appointments was that they would agree to vote for an abolition of the House of Lords if such a vote arose? I'm very grateful to the for his, uh, for his remarks on that. I think the Liberal Democrats had quite a similar position as well. Um, I'm afraid that when it comes to the appointment of the House of Lords, it's like the political drugs that once you start doing it, you just keep going. And the idea that, that, that somehow political parties will be self regulating on this really does, uh, it's not something I take very seriously. But Mr Walker, the House of Lords does make an absolute mockery of British democracy and we can come here and we can have a discussion about reform, we can have a, a discussion about abolition, certainly the latter of which is, is my preferred option. But I've got to say, the sooner that Scotland is completely has nothing to do with the House of Lords and the Palace of Westminster, <coughs> the better in my view.